Uh, Paul holds a Bachelor of Arts in Geography and a Master's of Architecture from uh, the UBC. Please help me welcome Paul Fast. Thank you, Tony. Um, <clears throat> It's good to be with you all today. Uh, my name is Paul. Um, I'm a principal at a, a firm called HCMA here locally. We have a, a long history of, of working in the public sector and on municipal um, institutional uh, type projects. And so a lot of what I'm talking about today is our experience in that sector. And that, that work has taken us kind of from Vancouver um, all the way across the country and, and beyond. Um, and so the topic that, that I'm going to talk about today is, um, is about the, the way in which we see the relationship between architects and, and architecture and, and the world around us changing, because we think it is. Um, but before we go there, I guess, uh, so we're talking about disruption. And um, I, I don't know about you, but I'm not a guy who just wants disruption for disruption's sake. Um, I actually want to know that it's leading towards an end, that there's something, there's something coming for it. And so we ask ourselves, what are we disrupting and, and why? And in the case of architecture, the question that we've been posing ourselves is, is architecture broken? Is, does it work? Is architecture, the way we've practiced it, capable of meeting the needs of the generations that are to come? And, and our answer, and this is maybe an extreme way of positioning that question. But to some degree, we feel quite strongly that um, we are losing, as a profession, our relevance to today's society, and that we are not, um, we are going to lose relevance in, in our ability to answer to the goals and priorities that our communities are going to ask for us. So that's my, that's I guess my challenge question um, that I'm that I'm trying to answer this 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 afternoon. Um, I'm going to I'm going to walk you through a highly oversimplified version of, of architectural history. Um, to prove my point, one of the things I'm going to come to at the very end of the presentation is that um, one of the things that we think is is problematic with the way architects are practicing today is that we've lost a sense of social purpose. And we think that um, re-engaging with our social mandate as practitioners um, is vital in terms of maintaining our relevance to, to the communities and what they need from us today uh, and tomorrow. Um, so working backwards from that, I'm going to try and kind of convince you of that over the next, I think Tony gave me 15 minutes. Um, if we looked way back, hundreds of years ago, um, we would argue that this is the, is, is the first act of architecture, that the, the notion of building something, of crafting something, of putting two things together and building form, the hearth around the fire, was actually um, the, the first sort of intentional um, way of, of designing. Um, and in that same act, while it was an act that was pragmatic in terms of bringing people heat and around a fire, it was also a social act and it brought people together uh, in a circular form around a heat source. If you were to kind of fly very quickly forward um, a couple of hundred years from that, um, We've taken that kind of sense of social purpose or that mandate, and we've interpreted it in very different ways over the last few hundred years. And more recently, I guess in the 60s and 70s, we interpret it very poorly. Um, you know, there's um, those of you here who practice in that day and age um, remember the, the times of sort of social engineering and a very top down. Uh, imposition of values and design on the communities in which architects operated. Uh, and of course that failed drastically and it failed miserably. And I think that one of the outcomes of that was that we as architects kind of retreated from our sense of social purpose. And we took a step back and we said, we're not going there anymore. We've been burned and, and for whatever reason it didn't work and we're going to step back. And I think that's what's kind of what we're kind of trying to emerge out of or what we think we should be emerging out of uh, in the coming day. That retreat from a sense of social purpose has kind of redirected our focus in a number of different ways. Um, and what we've seen over the last, certainly over the last kind of 20 to 30 years, um, are a focus on things like form, um, perhaps an overly obsessive uh, uh, focus on form, um, focus on, on, on technological fixes to things that can't always be solved with technological means. Um, and certainly, in all of those things, you know, we don't, we don't, we're not dismissing notions of form or of craft. But what we are suggesting is that before we go and build, before we go and form things as architects or as builders, we need to ask why we're doing it, and why what we're doing, and how what we're doing is going to impact the community that it's going to land in, and that's going to have to to live with that thing that we're that we're kind of giving birth to. 
A lot of these discussions kind of came to a head recently um, at the World Architecture Festival in Berlin, where um, a gentleman named Patrick Schumacher, who is the, the current head of the Zaha Hadid design studio after Zaha's passing, um, he gave a keynote speech. And in that speech, he, um, he essentially called for um, social housing to be scrapped and, and for public space to be privatized. And essentially, he was arguing that mo the, the majority of public infrastructure should be turned over to, to, the, private, uh, to the private sector. And um, it was interesting for us to see the reaction to that. Because uh, in a very short order, um, the protests went up. And this is right outside of their, their, the front doors of their studio. Uh, people were protesting because um, because people felt a disconnect with that we way of viewing um, social infrastructure, public infrastructure, uh, and the way in which he was um, advocating to ta to change that. The board of Zaha Hadid Architects um, issued a statement the following day, essentially distancing the firm from the views of Patrick Schumacher. Um, and so what that told us was that the, the discourse is changing and that the values around design and the, what, what, what the public is asking from us as architects is changing. Um, people are, it's no longer okay for us simply just to ignore um, the impact that our buildings have on the communities in which they land. And we can't afford not to because the problems, quite frankly, are too big. And we can't ignore those problems, whether these are economic or whether these are social or whether they're technological or ecological. We can't ignore the problems that are facing the world today. Uh, and that's not just speaking from an architect's hat, but it, I'm speaking for the building industry as a whole. We're responsible for a lot of the mess that we've created. And now we've got to figure out how we're going to get out of that. And, and I guess what I would argue is, um, the, actually, I'm going to take you back to a, a gentleman named Andrew Ross um, wrote a book called Bird on Fire. And one of the interesting things is he, he characterized some of the problems we're facing today not purely as technological problems, but as social problems. And he, and he talks about um, that uh, climate change, as an example, is a vast social experiment in decision making and democratic action. He goes on to say that um, things like climate crisis is as much a social as a biophysical challenge. The ways in which we address issues like climate change will not be solely by technological or environmental means. The resiliency of the communities around us um, will, be, will be hugely necessary in order to navigate, because change will come. Um, and, and the ways in which our communities are prepared to respond for those, our human, our human networks, our, the resiliency of our communities, is, is going to be paramount to doing that successfully. So I guess what I'm what I'm here to try and um, advocate for is that we is that we need to reshift our focus, and that has a lot to do with kind of shifting the way in which architects have practiced traditionally to the way that we think architects need to uh, embrace the the future. And um, so our firm HCMA has been on a, on a mission to kind of understand what it means to design for social impact as a primary goal, as a primary design goal. And in the process, we've come to understand that um, we can't do that through the model of a traditional practice and that we actually just need to disrupt that and, and redesign the firm uh, in order to be able to, to address those needs. Uh, I want to talk about just a few small projects that we've been engaged in that kind of will, will give you a little bit of meat to that, um, to that conversation. One of the tools that we've been applying is, is called the Social Impact Framework. And what this does is essentially it, it, we apply this to a project and we start every project in a discussion, uh, in a workshop, an engagement around values and principles. We don't start with design. We don't start with design strategies. We don't start with formal ideas. We don't even start with site constraints. We talk about what's important from a value standpoint to this particular opportunity, and then we layer in a set of processes that's going to ensure that the end design goal, the end design product, is going to be true to those values. That we don't just kind of um, pay lip service to them and then build whatever the, whatever we want, uh, but that we actually say this is how we're going to we're going to execute those on those values all the way through. We've been recently applying this uh, in the city of Surrey to um, the Clayton Heights Community Center project. And the city of Surrey had an interesting problem. Um, they had a bunch of different groups from arts, library, recreation, and, and outdoor groups that wanted to build a single facility. And yet those organizations, um, from a departmental level, from a budgetary level, um, don't, uh, don't, don't see, uh, well, I wouldn't say don't see eye to eye, but they certainly don't share um, the same budgets. They don't share the, sh share the same operational constraints. And so it's, very, it's hard to imagine all of them kind of coexisting under one roof. But that was the mandate. And to do that, we had to get everybody into a room and, and get everybody in the room to agree on something, some sort of an end design product. 
And so we started by, um, by having people talk about, um, about key values for the project. Uh, and these were equity, social inclusion, security, and adaptability. And from that, we were able to build consensus. People were able to understand, yes, we can be on the same page about those values. And once there's a shared understanding about values, about social values, we can then move into a more fruitful discussion about how that looks in the physical form. So that project is ongoing today. Um, we also realized through the course of that project that we need to reinvent the language we're using when we talk about design. Because the days of going out to the public um, uh, about a design project, and there's 50 boards uh, on easels very much like that with you know, uh, eight size aerial font you know, that's this dense, are gone. Um, we need to, if we're, honest, if we're being honest about actually giving the public a say in what we're doing, um, we need to actually communicate that and, and give them the opportunity to understand what we're talking about. So this is why we're starting to layer on communications design into a lot of our projects and, and bringing people like that um, in-house, not only to, to kind of do the graphic work, but also to layer into architectural design um, as, as a discipline. Another project I want to briefly touch on is Castlegar, and there was a unique challenge here in Castlegar. They were facing um, the decline of a very kind of uh, central facility in their community, um, the, the local kind of community and rec center. Interestingly enough, they went, uh, they went, they did a, about seven or eight years ago, they had a design done for an upgrade that was much needed. And they took that to the, to the community in the form of a referendum to increase the taxes. And the community said, overwhelmingly, forget it. 80% voted against the project. So seven years later, they hired us and they decided to try again. And some of the things we heard were um, they didn't listen to us. They presented us with an, with an all or nothing design. There was no flexibility in terms of scaling it up or down. It would cost way too much. And we, we didn't really know if we needed a new rec center. Like we, we didn't know if it actually provided value to us. And so that was the challenge. And, and I guess it, it, it's sort of symptomatic in a lot of ways in, it, of, of the way in which we've traditionally operated in the design field um, is working on some of these assumptions. So we came up with a concept. The first thing we did was actually brand the project um, in a way that directly put the ownership for the process back in the hands of the community. So the build your own activity hub concept was applied through all of the, the materials and the design concepts. And then what we did was actually say, um, we actually broke the project down into pieces um, and, and asked people to tell us, what do you which pieces do you think are important? And they had, a, they had an associated price tag and they could kind of assemble this thing in a way that made sense for them. And this is not, we're not advocating design for design by committee here. This is not kind of an abdication of professional responsibility. This is saying we're separating out values from technical issues and allowing the public a say in values, which is what, they, which is what they should be entitled to. So we're at a point now where um, we've been able to kind of turn the tide on that particular situation um, in a way that is quite significant. And we're not at the end gate yet. Um, we're moving towards that referendum. But in the most recent survey, we've now got 76% of the people in the community that have said, yes, we want a project of this nature to happen, to move forward. And it's more expensive than the one that was proposed back in 2010. The last thing I want to talk about is, um, is laneways. Um, and these projects are, uh, this, this project in particular is, is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, because there's a sense of this project didn't have a client. Um, it was really done in partnership with the DVBIA and the city of Vancouver. And there was no, certainly no um, normal fee to speak of. It, this wasn't a profit generating project for us. But it was something we really wanted to do because we felt that there was an opportunity here to recapture underutilized space in the city for public good. So we set on a quest to ask ourselves, how do we make a place um, for people in, in Vancouver's laneways? And so we started, we partnered with the, the, the local BIA and the city, and we came up with this notion of inserting um, the notion of play into the heart of the financial district. We didn't want to overwhelm that kind of local context, um, but just this fine-grained infill. So we painted the floors and the walls and everything with really bright colors, court markings. We put up basketball hoops in the alley, and we wrapped cafes in from the end with, with seating. Uh, and then we opened it up. And it, the response absolutely overwhelmed us. Um, the community adopted this thing like wholeheartedly. Um, the people are doing stuff in that alley that we never envisioned um, they would do. The local, the local language school um, does their phys ed classes in the alleyway now. Um, and people, people just, it's taken, it's taken the community by storm. In fact, um, 
things like disco pop parties um, happen that are completely, un like we have nothing to do with the programming, neither does the BAA. They simply, I don't, I don't know if they got a permit or not, but they simply, they simply set up shop and they decided they were going to have a party in an alleyway in Vancouver which is a fantastic thing to be able to see spaces that you've been involved with actually be, actually the community actually taking ownership over, over, over those. Um, it, took instant, uh, it took instant media, Instagram, uh, it took social media by a storm and that was another sign for us that there was a hunger in the part of the public um, for spaces that, were, that, could, that, could, that they could feel a sense of belonging in, that they could connect to, something that was vibrant and fresh um, that, that was really democratic in its, in its application. The other thing that's really important when we talk about social impact work is being able to convey the sense of value around that because, you know, I mean, we're all in the building industry, so you have to prove everything by either schedule or, or, or dollars and cents. So we actually measured. Um, we measured the foot traffic before and after. And we, um, we, what we were able to find was that the foot traffic almost tripled after the installation. And more importantly, the ratio of um, women to males actually increased in the space. So we were actually able to increase by almost 50%, which is an indicator in, in kind of urban designing, urban realm terms of, of safe space. So this, and if you go there at any time of day um, throughout the course of the week, weekday or weekend, you'll find people in that, in that space. Um, that was before quite a sort of a neglected, neglected space. I'm going to finish off um, uh, with a really quick story here because I guess going back to this whole concept of, of picking up our, our social mandate, one of the things that's always in the back of our minds with projects like the laneways is um, what happens to the population that actually calls these laneways home? Because the last thing that we wanted to do in an effort, in some sort of a social effort, was displace a portion of the population that actually need, actually calls these places home. And so we had um, we had an interesting encounter with a gentleman named Rob. And Rob is a binner. Um, and the guy on the left is my colleague Mark. And Mark ran into Rob one day in the alley. Rob Rob lives in this alley. And um, so Mark took the opportunity to ask Rob. Um, he said. Uh, what, what's happened in your life as a result of this space? Has it changed things for the good or for the bad? Or what, well, just let me, so Rob, and Rob is quite, he's quite a comical character. And um, he was in a bin and he popped up and he held up a banana and he said, well, the food sure has gotten better. <laughs> <laughs> but then he said something that, that um, absolutely floored me and which will stick with me for the rest of my life. And that is that um, he said that kids now come up to me and talk to me. People actually will have a conversation with me. They never did that before. It's a safe place for me to actually be part of a community. And I guess you know when we talk about uh, social impact design and 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 you know being disruptive and and socially good and all that. Um, I guess my hope is this: that we would um, we would find a new sense of purpose in our buildings, in the way we build, in the way we design, that just goes beyond a love of form and design, but actually ha makes a difference in the in the world. And it's important, right? I mean, we can't not ask ourselves those questions because people like Rob depend on us too. Um, the people that we leave the city that we love uh, to the next generation, they they depend on us to ask those types of questions. Thank you. <laughs>